Okay, perfect. Sorry I can't be with you in person. I'm so glad you all get to be together. Again, my name is Caroline Willard. I'm the Chief Cultivation Officer at Open Collective. We are a platform that's dedicated to transparent budgeting and are very aligned with what you're doing here with the future of philanthropy. We currently support 15,000 groups who are grassroots activists raising and spending $35 million a year in full transparency. I wanted to start with this image behind me because many of you just heard from Amaka Agbo, CEO at Katali. In Agbo's restorative economics theory of liberation, which is visualized here, according to art.coa, an emphasis is placed on community ownership and democratic governance for political, cultural, and economic power. In other words, who owns the project and who decides where the resources will go? These are the key questions for today and for the future of philanthropy. I've had the pleasure of curating and co-facilitating a learning cohort for JRF with around a dozen foundations in the UK over the last few months. And what I've heard again and again is that the future of philanthropy in the UK must be one where infrastructure is created that supports shared ownership and shared decision making. Many foundation directors in the learning journey I curated asked, but how do we support and cultivate these emergent infrastructures? Today you get to hear from some of the people leading this work. You'll hear from Emma Shaw, co-founder of the Library of Things, Nikishka Iyengar, founder and CEO of the Guild, and Leo Freeman, director of fund development at Seed Commons. The three of them are here in front of you, and they bring decades of expertise and experience to this room. Their bios are in the program, so I won't elaborate further. You'll hear from each of them for around five minutes, and then we'll get into a conversation. You'll learn about existing and emerging practices for community and ecological wealth building, and specifically about the financial instruments that support this. Let's start with Emma's systems change work, and then hear from Nikishka, and then Leo. Take it from here, Emma. Thank you, Caroline. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emma Shaw. I started my career in natural sciences, so I studied plant sciences and ecosystems and the impacts of climate change. Um, and I've also always loved playing around with business ideas. Um, I just love the creativity of it. So I started my first little business at school. And my work really is about weaving those two interests together. Um, so how do we build businesses that are at their core um, a force for good for the planet and for everyone who lives on it? Um, and so my deepest connection to this work is through a company called Library of Things which I started uh, about nine years ago with a couple of friends and a group of our neighbors in South London. It started very much as a grassroots experiment. Um, we read an article about a neighborhood equipment lending library in Germany, um, and we wanted to bring that, that idea to the UK, and we just started on our local high street. Um, and so we were all volunteers. It was very informal. We had no money. We had no, no assets of our own. Uh, but we did set ourselves a very big mission, which was how can we make borrowing things better than buying them better for people and the planet? Um, and so really what this was, was the opposite, trying to be the opposite of the consumerist machine in basically every way, like a direct competitor to Amazon. Um, and the idea of a library of things itself is very simple. Um, any neighborhood can have affordable access to collections of high quality items, think drills and sewing machines and sound systems and hedge trimmers and ukuleles, waffle makers, ice cream makers, all sorts. And rather than every individual buying and owning one themselves, why not pay a fraction of the price or to rent or borrow it from somewhere local to you? And this library of things can live inside any space. It might be your local library or a community center or a reuse shop or a shopping mall. Um, and so there are now 14 locations like this uh, that we run around London. Um, and the way it works is simply that the more you borrow from Library of Things, the more money you save, the more new connections and new experiences you make, the more waste is collectively saved from landfill or from even being manufactured in the first place. So it's, had, it's always had this amazing multiplier effect and some of that we can quantify in tons of carbon and tons of waste and some of it we can't. 
Um, and so, you know, one member said, just having a library of things in my local area gives me hope, it gives me a sense of hope. Mm. Um, and so over the years, we've had literally hundreds, if not thousands of invitations from people and businesses all around the world saying, hey, we want to have a library of things in our neighborhood or as part of our business. And our focus has been, okay, well, how do we, how do we serve that demand? This is, this is a movement as much as it is a business. And so that's what we've been trying to do, trying to make it possible for any community anywhere to have access to a library of things if they want one. Uh, and that's where the fundamental challenge lies, really, is how do we access the kind of capital we need to do that? So the first few years was a pretty traditional start. Um, we're a typical nonprofit company in the UK. Um, and we funded ourselves with local rewards-based crowdfunding and applying for every grant we could find and building up a decent trading income. Um, but that setup we found was keeping us small. Um, and whilst this is a simple idea, doing a library of things and practice is actually pretty complicated. And we found that we needed to build easy to use software to do the reservations and the cataloging and the payments and um, operating systems for repairs and insurance and uh, like hiring brilliant people who can strike up partnerships with everyone from IKEA and to local governments and tapping into local movements. And so, you know, that's, that's expensive. Um, and so about five years ago, um, we reached a bit of a crossroads and, and realized that to do this really well and to actually serve that, that mission, we needed to find an injection of capital, um, about a million pounds, we thought, to start with. And so we needed a business structure that would enable us to do that um, and to give us flexible access to finance while sticking to our values and putting the social mission above all else. Um, and so how did we do that? Um, we started by reaching out to an amazing lawyer called Patrick, um, who helped us transition towards a steward ownership model. Uh, and that, we found, was the most robust way to legally lock in our social mission, um, whilst making it possible <coughs> to raise, if we wanted to, equity investment, so to sell shares in the company as well. Um, and the beautiful thing about that model is we also have a guardian shareholder. And so we have mission guardians who represent our community of stakeholders, who we exist to serve. Um, which is, you know, our community, our partners, the planet. Uh, and so those representatives bring those voices into strategic decision making. And at the time, there was hardly any examples of this. Uh, you might be aware of it starting to grow a bit. In Germany, the purpose company is more of a movement there. Um, Tony's Chocolate Only, the chocolate company, has just moved to the structure as well. And so in terms of the, the financing, First, we went to the social, you know, the trusts and foundations, the charities that we trusted in the UK. The social investment sector is pretty small, and we felt like they were the good guys. And so we started by pitching them a revenue share instrument, actually, which had an equity-like risk profile and a capped return. We thought that would be a good fit. Um, and no, not a single one could or would fund it. And so uh, then we you know, went back to the drawing board and, and actually said, well, we've got this option to raise equity investment. Um, and so we switched to, to the world of business fundraising, you know, startup fundraising. And as three female co-founders, I think we just had not anticipated the, the macho and kind of male-dominated atmosphere that we'd be going into um, in, in this country. Just 1% of startup venture funding goes to women-led companies. So that's one penny in every pound. Um, and even in the impact space, the venture capital kind of Silicon Valley narrative is so strong that we just found we were between a rock and a hard place. So we weren't charitable enough for the foundations and we weren't unicorn enough for the, um, mm. for the business funders. And so our proposition really is we will seek a fair return. Uh, we call it the fair X, a fair return for investors in exchange for the risk that they take in putting their money into the organization and we will provide that return without compromising our social mission. That is it, kind of simply. And for many, the psychology of that fairness is just so at odds with how they're used <coughs> to investing, which we can talk about a bit more, but you know, more of a boom bust kind of approach. Um, but those who did get it, like really got it and said, you know, this is what we've been looking for. Um, and so over three years, we raised 1.5 million pounds in that equity with that equity instrument. Um, and that came from 
whole mix of people, but high earning women who had never made an investment in a startup before, who could benefit from a government tax relief scheme we have here, which helps de-risk that. Um, from people who describe themselves as social capitalists who are looking for that middle ground of business and impact. Um, from family offices, especially second generation wealth holders who are kind of seeking these inspiring examples of really regenerative investment practice. Um, and then just from ordinary people, uh, because we took it to the crowd, um, who don't have big chunks of capital, but actually really do want to be part of this. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap there. I think what I will say to end is that this is a, in our experience, this has been a really small pool of capital, real niche. Um, and for Library of Things, it's now looking to grow its investment community and help evolve and move it to the next stage. And there's still a, a lot of work to do there. Um, and so, yeah, I think we'll talk about some of the barriers and opportunities for that in the panel. I'll pass to Nikishka. Hey everyone, my name is Nikishka. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the founder and ecosystem director of a community wealth building organization in Atlanta, Georgia, called The Guild. Um, and we're focused on building community-owned models of land, housing, and real estate as a means for self-determination for black and brown communities. Um, our work is actually rooted in the restorative economics framework that Amaka laid out for us. Um, she's been an incredible funder, partner, um, and the ent entire Catelli Foundation team. Um, our work to creating these models of community ownership um, has been a little bit of a winding road. Um, when I started the Guild, I was really just starting the Guild as a way to build community for myself in Atlanta. I had moved to Atlanta about 10 years ago, um, and I was at the time working in corporate sustainability and um, specifically in climate impact with Deloitte Consulting. So a big management consulting company working with our clients to, to reduce emissions, and I was, um, I guess getting demoralized by uh, the sort of slow pace at which change was happening. Um, and that was my, um, you know, just realization that what we were working on was these sort of small reforms um, while still continuing to perpetuate this broader system of capitalism that was causing all these problems in the first place. And so um, while I worked at Deloitte, um, I needed that job to have a visa in the country, to stay in the country, so I kept that job, but I started building the guild on the side and um, really wanted to bring like-minded like people together, people that understood that at the heart of every inequity that we were seeing um, in, our, in our neighborhoods and in the world at large, um, that capitalism and racial capitalism was at the, at the sort of root of it. And so I brought together um, social entrepreneurs, community organizers, creatives, um, and we had a focus on, on BIPOC individuals um, and people that were serving BIPOC communities. Um, and I had designed this sort of like live work space for them. So we provided affordable housing as well as programming to support um, their needs as leaders, to support their ventures, to support them as people. Um, and it was structured as a 10 month program at the time. And when people were leaving our program, um, they were having, they had a wonderful experience, but were having a hard time finding affordable housing once they left. Um, if they were small business owners or um, artists, creatives, nonprofit leaders, they were having a hard time finding affordable commercial space. So gentrification has um, really had a stranglehold in Atlanta. Just to give you all a little bit of context about Atlanta, um, it is touted as the black mecca in the US, right? We, um, we had a majority black population for a very long time. And as of this year, actually, it's fallen below 50%. Um, it is, uh, so on the one hand, it's known as the black mecca. On the other hand, it is number one in income inequality in the country. The racial wealth gap is continuing to grow. Um, in the last two years, one in three homes um, has been bought by investors. And so it's a hyper speculative real estate market. Um, and, and gentrification is sort of, um, really destroyed a lot of communities there post the 2008 crisis. And so um, this is the context in which we're doing this work. And as people, like I said, were leaving our program, they were butting up against the same challenges that um, we all sort of like knew theoretically, right? Um, and so at that point, I, I went on this journey to, to partner with developers to figure out what is a strategy around development of neighborhoods without displacement look like. Um, and 
it took me on a really interesting journey because while I was partnering with what I thought was, you know, what developers that had branded themselves as social impact developers, as B Corps, as all of these things, um, ultimately the way the projects were playing out on the ground um, didn't look much different. And so the result of that was that we ended up getting displaced. We were serving as operators at that point, and we ended up getting displaced because in the middle of the pandemic, they raised our rents. Um, and so the, it was a very clear understanding that despite the branding, despite the mission, if the capital going into these projects is not at um, on reasonable terms um, and is not on contextual terms that understands the needs of these neighborhoods, and as you know, so long as um, decision making just sits with the equity investors in real estate projects or the developers, now we're going to end up seeing the same um, issue sort of perpetuate and the same harms perpetuate. And so. We went on a learning journey as the guild, and now I have a staff of five, and we're all worker owners in the cooperative. Um, and these people, a lot of them came from living in our, in our spaces, so have had lived experience with us, um, but have also come from the neighborhoods that we're intending to serve. Um, and so uh, we went on a learning journey to understand you know, what alternative forms of real estate look like, because if you think about and I'm sure the context exists here in the UK as well, but in the US, if you think of any social inequity that you might want to fund as a funder, right? Think about climate change, think about the overfunding of our carceral systems, think about um, the defunding of our public education systems, think about affordable housing, like all of that has, at the root of that is this invisible hand of real estate that has been sort of moving the, the chess pieces across the board and communities um, oftentimes just don't have an understanding because it's, it's invisibilized by design, right? Um, and so we, we went on this journey to figure out what is an alternative model of real estate development look like that actually um, uh, facilitates self-determination for black and brown communities. Um, and so we've developed this model called the Community Stewardship Trust that takes vacant, abandoned properties in neighborhoods, um, predominantly black neighborhoods that have now been gentrified, black or brown neighborhoods that are now being gentrified um, and turn them back into the hands of the community. So for our first project, um, we, we purchased a building that was sitting vacant for about um, a decade. Um, we did a two-year co-design process with the surrounding neighborhood to see, you know, ask folks what they wanted to see here because they were gonna be ultimate stewards of the property. Um, so they asked for, you know, affordable housing. So we're building two stories of permanently affordable housing through a housing cooperative. Um, they also said the neighborhood was impacted by food apartheid, right? Food, food security was an issue. Um, and so we're bringing a, a grocery store, a small format neighborhood grocery store, um, three small kitchens for BIPOC food entrepreneurs, um, and then Atlanta's first solidarity economy lab where we get to be in active imagination and practice with these ways of building an alternative world. And once construction's complete, um, this moves into our stewardship trust and Anybody in the zip code can purchase shares for as little as $10 a month, um, and then they get paid back through um, the net income, net operating income of the property, as well as when property prices do go up because we're in a gentrifying neighborhood, um, their share price goes up. So it's not just a sort of a negative signal. They, there's a small wealth building component in that. Um, and then the rest of it gets reinvested back into mutual aid and um, affordable housing for the surrounding, um, surrounding neighborhood as well. So, that's sort of the model. I'm sure we'll get more into it, but in terms of, of capital, um, and you heard, I'm, I'm glad I don't have to restate what Amaka said because she laid it out so beautifully, um, but we're very intentional about, um, when we talk about things like return, very intentional about um, working with investors that understand we're looking for reparative capital. These are neighborhoods that have not just been disinvested from, they're not just been excluded, they have been extracted and stolen from, and that's that cycle is continuing um, right now. And so people that understand that and are working at somewhere in the zero to 4% range of return. Um, and we've also assembled um, now, a, or assembling a fund, an integrated capital fund that can invest in projects like this. And the idea is that you know every neighborhood can have a stewardship trust where assets in the neighborhoods that can meet the neighbor's needs um, can be put into collective governance. And so this could, in the first property, it looks like housing, it looks like a grocery store, it looks like commercial kitchens um, and some co-working space. The next project could look like a daycare, it could look like an urban farm. Whatever meets the neighbors, the neighborhood's needs could be put into collective ownership. So 
I see my time is up. I'll pause there, but that's good. You can it. see it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> both. Hi, can you all hear me? Good. Um, it feels like the in-person version of Zoom, like I feel like I might be the guy who's muted. Um, <laughs> hi everyone, I'm Leo Freeman. I use he, they pronouns. Oh, now I can hear myself. Um, I am from California, which you could probably learn um, when I tell you more about who I am. Um, I'm a transgender, transsexual, vegan, anti-capitalist, abolitionist, <laughs> which flags that I'm from the Bay Area. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just really wanna take a second to, to offer a lot of gratitude. Thanks so much, Caroline, for, for organizing us to be here. Um, one of the things that I've found so often is that in this work that is really like core to, I think, so much of the messaging around ownership and governance and community is that um, I find myself here because of women of color mostly. Um, so today, you know, I want to thank and shout out to Steph Robbie for an invitation here from the Good Ancestor Movement. <laughs> woo woo! <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> um, it, honestly, pretty much everything that I've done from the time of being in traditional finance, which I never thought I would find myself in, um, has been mostly, you know, on the shoulders and, and, and in the arms, <laughs> loving arms of women of color, people dragging me along <laughs> in this work. Um, so hope to offer some of those learnings here. I think that's a big part of why I'm here is to offer that kind of empathetic learning and also just uh, thinking about Nkem's, you know, um, reminder about trauma um, and the, the you know, space that we find ourselves in. And I think especially in philanthropy, something that um, I've learned. Uh, so I, I came into finance kind of circuitously um, as a financial advisor, um, but I started at a registered investment advisory firm in Sacramento, California. Uh, I was an executive assistant to a CEO who was succession planning on his way out. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time um, as, a, <laughs> as someone who could write an email well and um, <laughs> just like a key strength I think I, I have, <laughs> I own. <laughs> um, and he uh, ended up you know, divorcing his uh, third wife to remarry his first wife, which feels like it should be a movie. And um, I could probably write the script because I was really deep, deep in the work just being the person that was kind of doing it. So if anybody in here has ever been an executive assistant, you know you oftentimes are doing the work for the CEO. Um, and it was a really powerful moment for me to really learn traditional finance, the way that the economy works. But more than that, the way that, um, yeah, that gatekeepers operate. Um, and becoming a gatekeeper and coming into this, you know, doing evaluation of a registered investment advisor. So it's, a, it's like an investment, you know, wealth management firm, an RIA. Um, learning how we perpetuate the narratives of capitalism in individual personal trusting relationships with clients. Um, learning about fiduciary duty, this like really super pervasive, uh, I heard on the last panel about trustees, but you know, this thing that we'd like to blame. Oh, I'd love to help, or I'd love to invest in community, but I have my fiduciary duty. And it's, you know, a, a different model of, I think, institutionalized escapism. Mm. Um, so anyway, continue to learn there. Um, learned a lot about myself um, in the process. Learned a lot about how to, how I wanted to show up and kind of how I didn't want to show up. Um, but I definitely think that my history of the last eight years in, in the financial sector has been a big process of unlearning and a lot of therapy and um, going through the process of drinking the Kool-Aid and just being like, this is what's gonna keep me personally safe. And then learning, especially through the pandemic, I think a lot of us learn this all together, that like there's really that no amount of money that will keep you safe when it really stuff hits the fan. Um, so that was a really powerful like moment for me, key transition. And so one of the things that grew out of that um, in my community was we built this group of folks, um, which is where I met Steph Robbie, um, called Radical Planners. Um, we're, we're really financial advisors, money coaches, planners, folks that kind of are operating as gatekeepers of capital um, in the, mostly in the advice space. So like people who are, um, working with clients, organizing to yeah, radically change the financial services industrial complex from the inside and sort of steward um, our clients toward redistribution, um, build right relationship with community, build relationship with each other, find community with one another and sort of say like, oh, there's other people going through this, the same thing that I'm in. 
Um, so that was, a, that was a powerful organizing home for me, was sort of the Band-Aid that got ripped off. I have no idea how much time I've left, but I think I'll see a piece of paper back there, but if someone wants to wave it, oh, thank you. Um, so, no, this is perfect. Two is perfect, no, thank you, I love it. Um, I could ramble the whole time. Um, so I, I appreciate the, the, the community of Rad Planners, for me personally, was a space that started out, six of us that you know now today grew to about 200 advisors who are doing radical work, which is like the most grassroots organization I've been a part of since Food Not Bombs, like in my early 20s. Um, and so like as an anarchist, as an organizer, I'm sort of like, this is a really powerful thing that grew out of people looking for community and teaching each other. So conferences like this are so cool to me because we get to teach each other. I've heard a lot of the encouragement around like, you know, go talk talk to your you know your colleagues in the breaks and stuff. I think that's like really powerful. And then I hope a lot of this seeds things. Um, one of the things I like to talk about is that I, I don't have any of the answers, and that's cool. Um, I I definitely believe that historically I I believe that I had to have all the answers, and I hope to like learn so many answers. So it's even nice to be able to hear that your two stories um, today, and and hope to continue to bring so much more of that um, to the space. So I hope everyone gets to learn. Um, and then the only other thing I want to, to sort of say about myself now is that I currently um, you know, have a day job at, at a, a really rad organization called Seed Commons. Um, we're a cooperative funder that does non-extractive lending. Um, it was one of the uh, things that Amaka mentioned, one of the projects that they've invested in and invested in integrated capital in. Um, I took this work, I've been at Seed Commons for the last year and a half. I took this work mostly to learn and bring back kind of information to this, you know, kind of financial services sector that I'm in. Um, and I love it and I don't want to go back. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm continuing to, you know, raise investment, but really seriously, like watching folks and learning around being in right relationship with community through a, a peer network um, model, really, you know, operating around like community leadership and also you know this thank you caroline for putting this on the screen community ownership and democratic governance investing in worker owned co-ops and being led by community around those decisions um and building community power through that so that's uh, that's me and thanks everyone for for being here and yeah happy to go to questions thanks guys Great, thank you all so much. And with the time left, I'd love to jump into the way that you all got started. I heard again and again from the around dozen or so foundation uh, directors and program officers in the UK that what's happening in the US is in many ways so different from the UK or so far ahead that uh, they were asking, how do we get started here? How do we create the enabling conditions for, for something like Seed Commons, for example? And it was interesting to learn that Seed Commons did have a $500,000 four or five year multi-year grant mm. just a decade ago. And now you're moving around 50 million. So I'd love to hear from each of you if you see differences between the US and the UK and what mindsets are required, what barriers are faced and how you would advise this community, let's say of peers, thank you, Leo, mm. um, their first steps, what's needed now? Yeah, happy to start. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, so I think, you know, from, from my vantage point, one of the, the ways that um, I feel encouraged to start is by experimenting. And um, I know that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. It's super uncomfortable for me. I can look back to many things in my life and personal experience, like my queerness, my transness, where it's just like the, some of those like deeply, deeply held beliefs are the hardest to you know, crack open. And, and I think one of the, the cool things is that once you get started, it kind of is momentum and you're, you, know, you, you kind of can't unsee things. Um, but I think in this space, one of the um, main themes that I've noticed is that it's often treated as like, um, you know, ca catalytic's a great word for it, but often folks use like concessionary and it becomes this very like, let's do the hard and bad thing. And it's all very focused, obviously very focused on financial. And so I think experimenting is huge and key. And I think, yeah, not trying to sort of say, I think what Maka said this before, like around um, 
I'm not trying to say I have a full understanding of the problem before you get started. So like moving and getting started in, in small ways will continue to will carry momentum. Um, see that a lot in, in activism and organizing where you know trying things on and um, and failing. And that's hard, I think, as individuals in, in philanthropy, especially as like a financial advisor, it's really hard to like go to your, you know, um, other stakeholders and, and offer failures. Um, one of the things I love that the Catali Foundation does is they post narrative online. So I, I referencing Catali a bunch, definitely recommend going to their website and reading their blogs. But one of the the, the bits in 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 a, in a podcast and a blog that I heard from um, from Lin Hoy was was around the idea of like failing and sort of saying this is a this is going to happen and using this as an opportunity to learn and sharing that out versus like hiding and burying our failures which i think is pretty human um so yeah i think continued continued experimentation and then um actually i'll let you two speak to other thoughts because i i could take 10. <laughs> yeah i'll just say like in our work we've what i've found we've had to do and i don't know I mean, it's interesting to hear people here say that the U.S. is that much more advanced. It doesn't feel that way, but <laughs> that's great to know. Um, I think for us, like, we've had to build not just our organization, but the entire ecosystem around us, speak from, like, mm. legal systems to, or, you know, policy, um, financial instruments. Like, there's a whole set of ecosystem components that are missing to sort of facilitate this just transition right now, um, especially where, where I'm located in the South. Um, the Bay Area is a little bit more <laughs> advanced with that. Um, and so, and, and we've been very clear in, in the mission of the Guild that we're focused on this world that we're trying to build and the ways in which we do it, like we, we have a saying we use internally that the means are the ends. The means are not, you know, it's not a means to an end, the means are the end. So how we do this work is, is as important as what we do. Um, and I think Amaka and, and Kim lifted this up earlier as well as if we're sort of moving at a pace that is frenzied or not conducive to our collective well-being, then we're not gonna build a world that facilitates our collective well-being. And so um, even, uh, you know, we're very heavy on the experimentation as well and then sort of reframing failure um, through, through a learning lens and making sure like to me failure is you know, our, one, of, one of our properties or two of our properties had to close down in the middle of a pandemic. Um, was that a failure? No, because at the end of the day, for me, our team was taken care of. Everybody was like mentally sound. Our families are taken care of. Um, and so just kind of reframing how we think about failure. But going back to the point around um, just building of this ecosystem, I think um, this work needs to be held in community. Someone else mentioned this earlier too, is, um, We've borrowed and collaborated and been in like comradeship with folks, I mean, like Seat Commons, like other people in um, other cities that have been experimenting with this as well. Um, and so the first thing, I guess, is just like the affirmation that there is a movement around us, whether or not we can see it. Um, it's been emerging for a while um, and we're all like, at the right, this is the right moment for it. Um, some of us have been sort of screaming into a void around <laughs> you know, down with capitalism or alternative forms of um, the economy and we were looked at as like we were the crazy ones and now people are like, oh yeah, capitalism, that's, that's the problem, <laughs> huh? Um, and so that's really assuring, um, but, but yeah, like I said, the, one of the things we struggled with, and maybe this is a difference between the US and the UK as well, um, we were having this conversation last night where when I said we're, the means are the ends and we're trying to build a different way of doing business. And in the US, you're, when you set up an entity, you're either a for-profit or a non-profit um, from the IRS, from our, like sort of as a tax designation, right? And if you look at the history, at least in the US, of like how non-profits or why the 501c3 model was set up and, and what it does right now, it actually co-ops and, and de-radicalizes a lot of our social movements, like that is, actually one of its very intentional functions. Um, and so when you're put into this binary of, you know, nonprofit or for-profit, we oftentimes get, I guess, uh, misconstrued for a nonprofit because of our mission, um, but we're cooperative. And so from the IRS's perspective, we're a for-profit entity. And so we actually end up paying sort of double taxation because of that. Um, and so those are things like there's, there's laws and sort of like policy um, changes that we're trying to make at the state level to, to give incentives for cooperatives so that 
it's not such a struggle to build this um, and that we don't need as much sort of quote unquote subsidy capital as we have needed. Um, and so that's one thing that we've been trying to do. And then yeah, I, I just I would say like finding if if it's advice that was part of the question, just like finding um, people that are working on similar issues in other places and and learning from history. Like I think a lot of times like when we're in this space of like new economy, new this, new that, like. Amaka lifted this up earlier too, is like we, at, and at the Guild, we talk about our work as like retrofuturistic, and so we are looking at history to look to the future. Um, black communities, indigenous communities, native communities, and communities of color around the world have had to figure this out before. So things like cooperatives, things like alternative ways with relating to land um, as you know stewarding land versus owning land. Um, these are things, there's models and templates and ways of being that have existed before. And so I think just like leaning into history to then bring that to the current context of where we are with sort of this late stage disaster capitalism, right? Um, and so, yeah, no real answers to, to what Leo said. Um, but just a lot of experimentation and and taking, um, I think Indy raised this up earlier in the, in the previous panel, but like doing a little time travel and like playing with time, like these are these are issues that have been created over centuries. If you if you go back to the colonization of Native people's land, slavery, all of that, right? Um, we're not going to solve them in three-year grant cycles, one-year grant reporting cycles, you know, five to ten-year loan cycles, even. Um, and so, but, but being sort of honest and um, accountable to what we can do now and demanding more of, of uh, resource holders and, and wealth holders right now um, in terms of how they think about redistribution. Um, and so a lot of work that we have to do is also just organizing capital, not just organizing our communities, but like organizing capital holders to, to take that, to, to engage in time travel with us. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there, that was a lot. <laughs> but well, I think there's a lot of parallels. I can maybe give a UK perspective and well, mostly from our own experience with Library of Things. But um, yeah, I think the main mindset challenge that we found was just how binary the funding landscape is. So. You, if you go to the charitable end of the scale, um, the expectation is almost that, well, maybe that's also, there's kind of two narratives there. One is it's just, um, you know, it should just be grant. Like if you're a risk profile of early stage, that is grant, but then the challenge is, well, that's so competitive to get the right kind of grants to do the work you need to do. And ultimately we needed to pay people fairly. And yeah, there's a tendency to want to fund sort of new programmatic work, but not necessarily like keeping the lights on. Um, or the under, under the scale within the charity space is just taking the venture capital narrative, but applying it to VC and calling it impact VC. And so looking for the impact unicorn. Mm. Um, and so that's, which, yeah, I find it really bizarre. And then on the, if you just go to, it was actually easier for us to go to, well, we're a sound business. Like we're not doing this to make no money. We see profit as a way of being financially independent and nourishing ourselves into the future. So, so targeting more of the startup funding world, well, then the challenge was we're not a unicorn and we're not going to tell you that we'll do the hockey stick. Um, but there is, a, there is a need to see that that, um, that risk reward story, which it really is a story, playing out in your business plan and your financial model. And you can... You can just as well tell that story, but it's whether or not you believe it and if it feels kind of like the organization you want to run. Um, and so, yeah, we, we landed in the middle and that made life difficult for us, but I think that was where the most interesting work was. Um, and then as well as it being a mindset story, um, that is very much locked into legal models and not just legal models of choosing whether you're a non-profit or a for-profit. And in, and in the UK, you can be a community interest company or a community benefit society, but they tend to be on the charitable end of the scale with asset lock. And so we needed to raise equity investment and that wasn't available to us. Um, but that same kind of, um, the legal fiduciary responsibility of a more of a business applies to funds too. So where it's a fund investing other people's money, they have made a commitment to those investors that they will maximize the return. And so we then found that, well, we can make money on this if it feels right, but it's not the reason to do it. And it's not, yeah, the means is the ends too. So we won't compromise the social mission. And so what you then find is 
this idea of a fair return doesn't land with funds. And so this, the audience that was most exciting for us was individuals really managing their own wealth and with their own autonomy. Um, but yeah, that legal lock it also applies to tax incentives and it just is so pervasive in the kind of hidden wiring. Mm. And, and I think it's worth saying that whilst we have experimented and we've done what felt right and we've pushed all of those boundaries, the tax law, the legal model, the, the funding um, narrative, it, this is ultimately, you know, in a, in, a, in a situation where you're trying to pay people at the end of the month mm. and that cash runway gets ever shorter and you can hold on to those values. But yeah. At what point do you change tack and, and kind of conform is a live is always a live question. Yeah. Well, I will keep us at time, so I'm gonna have to close us out. I want to thank the three of you so much and also remind everyone in this room that it's very likely that someone you meet today will begin a journey with you that enables you to do something ten years from now that seems impossible today. So I encourage you, especially if you're a shy person, to turn behind you and say hello to someone that you don't know. If you're a person who's very uh, social and has a human that you know you need to go find, I encourage you to find someone else. Consider someone that you don't know at all and approach them and talk about what you're working on. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the presenters Thanks, and enjoy the day. See you.